This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today I will be talking to Ian from from Ag- uh, how do you pronounce his last name from Ag- from English Ian from English he is the host of Ian Talks Comedy a podcast that's been going on since um uh quarantine started I believe and I discovered it by accident about a, about a year and a half ago um and I listened to it and it's a pretty interesting podcast he likes to talk to comedy writers of Saturday Night Live and Seinfeld and different sitcoms and stand up comedians and sketch comedians and just talk about comedy and I'm going to have him on the show today to talk about all of that stuff you know he did stand up comedy himself but he's primarily a school teacher and he's based in New York and he um, emailed me earlier this year. Turns out he's a fan of mine. I had no fucking clue uh, about that, and I didn't expect that email. I was I was very flattered. So we friended each other on Facebook, and we've been going back and forth ever since. And it's going to be a great conversation today. I can feel it because uh, we're both passionate about comedy. So yeah, here is my interview with Ian Fermiglish. Hey, Ian. Welcome to the show. How are you today? How are you? I am great. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, no. Thank you for doing the same. My pleasure. So, going back in time, uh, you're currently a school teacher. Uh, oh, but first, uh, what do you teach? teach economics and government for 12th grade in Richmond Hill in Queens, New York. Nice. So you're a high school teacher. Yes. Did you always want to be a teacher? Wanted to be a stand-up comedian. And uh, yeah. it took something to have as a fallback, just in case. Yeah. Well, that's all. Well, that's pretty interesting. Usually it's the other way around, but <laughs> that's pretty interesting. Um, yeah. I don't know how people go through life teaching, you know, when they just make shit money. And, you know, I knew a girl once who was a teacher year round, but in the summertime, like starting the day after the last year, the last day of the school year, she'd be working at Starbucks until the first day of the next school year. So God, I don't know how you, how you guys get through it. Money is not bad in New York City. Yeah. Uh, better in Long Island. But it's not, it's not as bad and it's as people think. Okay. And, and what's your story? I know you were a stand-up comedian. I did for 10 years in San Francisco. It started out good, and then once the, the woke culture started, I just... It started to get bad. I had trouble getting booked, and people were fucking doing he said, she said shit off stage, and I just I just got out of it when I moved up here to Reading, where there's no stand-up comedy up here. Mm. I did it, yeah, I did it for 10 years also, and it was basically, well, if you bring five people, you can, and I, I just couldn't bring, the, like, how many people do you know that you could just bring uh. them to, to hear you try to do... I don't understand that fucking bringer show shit. It is just horrible. You know, I mean, I was always practically begging people to come see me when I was performing at this one club that I would do open mic night at for eight years that, um, you know, they wanted people that brought people in to uh, perform. And they would just like say, they would say, oh, I'm not going to go all that way to, to see you perform there. I'll see you perform, you know, at that dive bar and shit. I'm like, Dude, I get. I need to get past at this club. I need to bring people in consistently. You know, that's the only way they're going to hire me. They didn't understand that. You know, it's just uh, stand-up comedy now is just it's a completely different thing. And I heard it's even worse now because of the woke culture. I'm sure I had um, a guest on uh, Gabe Abelson, yeah. and I told him one of my jokes from a stand-up act, and he goes. You know, you don't do that joke. And I'm like, well, that was my closer. I heard it. <laughs> and they like, well, what year? And I'm like, oh, 2010 was the last time I did it. But, yeah. Yep, yep. I heard that, that, that one um, last week, and I was just like, 
yeah, I mean, he's he's probably just generalizing, you know. But nah, I I fucking do it. Don't don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't do stand up, so. Yeah, well, if you decided to go back, I mean, you could. But uh, what year did you start doing stand up? In 2000. And is it just in New York? I, I got paid to do this one club in Delaware, but mostly just New York, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, were you uh, playing at, like, The Cellar or Catch or Dangerfields, the comic strip, those old places? The only one they said was the comic strip because uh, Catch is not there. Okay. Dangerfields, I never, I never got to see it. Um, and... But it was, it was like the new improv. Yeah. And it was like three blocks behind Leatherman's studio and had pictures of the old improv, but the people there were not the, you know, the famous improv people. And then the guy never showed up, uh, Bud Friedman. Yeah. And then it, they changed the name to the World Stand-Up Comedy. And it was the Times Square Comedy uh, Theater. So there's, there's so many comedy clubs in New York City. Mm-hmm. Now, who was there when you were there? Um, I'm trying to think, because I know I did, I, my second show I ever did, uh-huh. I did with, um, with Jim Gaffigan. Yeah. Tony Rock. Yeah. And, um. Uh, Steve Byrne. And Jim Norton. Uh, who did you say? Steve Byrne. Don't know. Kevin yeah. Bartini, I don't know if you know who he is. I've heard of him. Chuba Mason. Yeah. Jackie Mason's daughter. Oh, Jackie Gleason's daughter? Jackie Mason's daughter. Oh, Jackie Mason's daughter. Ah. I didn't know she did stand up. Wow. Hey, Shuba Mason. Did you see Jody Oliver? Yeah, she was. She's a New York actress, and she got into stand up late in life. And she's a little disabled from a from a car accident, uh, probably about ten years ago or so. I've I've had her on. I had her on once. She didn't like the way the interview sounded. And then we did another one like uh, uh, seven months later. And then she disappeared off social media after that. Yeah. So yeah, I did it from 2006 to 2016, and it was, yeah, so it started out good, but then just, yeah, the woke culture just killed it. I just, I, I didn't like the competitive nature. There's a lot of alpha dick slinging in comedy these days, you know, because it's gotten to the point now where everyone's doing it. And I think a lot of it has to do with Joe Rogan, you know, the guy who's a, a former jiu-jitsu, you know, guy and you know other athletes are like getting into it because remember back in the day it was all neurotic jewish guys going up on stage talking about their mothers now it's coming now it's now it's starting to be you know alpha bros yeah i get so much pussy you know that kind of i guess that's the jokes now yeah it used to be like i can't get laid now it's i get so much yeah joe rogan was a comedian first Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, he still is. Right. I, I, I think Joe, I think he's funny. I, I've never seen, never listened to his podcast because they're four hours long. Oh, let me tell you, they're repetitive because he's talking about the same things and everything. It's jujitsu. It's how fucked up the woke culture is. It's um, about health and comedy in the comedy store. That's all he talks about all episodes. The only time I listened is when Dan Aykroyd was on. Oh, that was a good one. I like that one. Because, you know, it's Dan Aykroyd, so I had to listen to it. Yeah. I watched one of your stand-up videos on YouTube. It was at Governor's. Yeah, that was the last one I ever did. Yeah. <laughs> you did that that that, 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 that joke about, about weight loss. I'm now an A cup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was pretty good. So, what stand-up comedians did you grow up watching? Um, see, I love that my parents let me watch stand-up. It was, anybody, it was, it was old school originally. It was, you know, uh, George Burns, really old school. Um, yeah. Audrey Dangerfield. Right. Uh, George Carlin. Um, those guys were my, were my favorite. Um, and, like, I was... I liked uh, Richard Pryor's movies more than I liked his stand-up. I know most people like 
Yeah, same here. I, I love the toy. And, I, um, yeah. I love the stand up, but it's but you know I I can't relate to it on an emotional level. Even though uh, I've heard people say, "Oh, I I don't I don't know what it's like to be a coke addict and have a horror mother, but he takes you there." And I was like, "He kind of does, but it's it's still something I can't really take in." You know what I mean? Like it's funny, but I I, I prefer his movies. You're right. And Eddie Murphy, who says you know he is like Richard Pryor, to me it's funnier. Yeah. Um, delirious and um, and uh, the other one. Oh, raw. Raw, raw. Yeah, I prefer delirious. My dad had it on tape. We used to watch Forty Eight Hours when my mom wasn't home, and then Delirious was on after it, and I had to go in my room for a, the longest time. Like my dad wouldn't let me watch it with him. And then I watched it by myself when I was 14. And all the jokes that I thought my, were my dad's own were on this special. Like, my dad was, was always quoting this around the house. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but it was funny, you know? And it's still one of my favorite stand-up specials of all time. But I would watch the Rodney specials with him, and I'd see Kinnison. That changed me forever when I was, like, two years old and that special aired. Um seeing him and uh, Bob Saget, Louis Anderson, Yakov Smirnoff, and Rita Rudner in that episode. But uh, it was for me, it was always Kinnison, Bobcat Goldthwait, Andrew Dice Clay, Bill Hicks, Richard Jenny, the really edgy guys. I got into George Carlin later and uh, just stuff like that. Yeah, those, I like the edgy guys as well. Uh, Gil, I love Gilbert Godfrey. Yep. <laughs> uh, Gilbert was so brilliant. I'm, I'm so sad that he's gone. It, it's like it's like a bad dream that he's gone. Yeah, and I had tickets to see Norm Macdonald in November of last year, and he, he died in September. Yeah, God, we've lost so many great guys. Yeah, it's been it's been terrible. Yeah, I was born right in the middle of the 80s during the comedy boom when HBO and Showtime was starting to have specials and you had an evening at the Improv. That's where you saw the best and worst comedians in L.A. <laughs> yeah, and um, Norm Macdonald and Oh yeah, I tried to get his buddy Turk Pipkin on last year. You know, he was always the art, the audience participant in his shows. You know, and uh, I know he he had a book out and he was doing all this press and all this other project stuff. It it didn't come to fruition, but you know maybe in the future. Um, uh, he was yeah he was great. I heard he used to like pickpocket people using his magic when he was struggling <laughs> before he was on um, Cheers and Night Court. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I tried to get her to come on, but she's she basically she does a lot of podcasts, and she's like, I can't do, I can't handle doing any more podcasts. So I was like, okay, no problem. Yeah, they say that, but then you know, but they they usually mean just for a little while, and then they'll start doing it again. That's what I found. Like, uh, she writes and performs on podcasts. Yeah, Bill Kirkenbauer said to me in 2018, I don't do podcasts anymore. Once quarantine hit, he was doing a lot of them. And I I was too busy with other people in the moment, so I didn't reach out again. And it, it's fine. Mm. Who, who would be your dream guest? As far as comedy goes? God, I mean, I've already had Murray Langston, the unknown comic, who's like one of my all-time uh, favorites and one of my idols growing up. Um, he was great. Uh, yeah, I've been Facebook friends with him for 12 years. I'm trying to get through to him. He wasn't uh, responding to my messages, and then Tom Dreesen helped out, and then I got him, and he was fantastic. Um, let's see, I talked to uh, Mitzi McCall and Charlie Brill earlier this year. They were great. Uh -huh. 
That was fantastic. I enjoyed them. Um, uh, probably the closest, and I've tried, um, uh, you know Jeff Abraham, right? Yeah, I, 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 wanted, I wanted to get Lorraine Newman, but she seems to be shy about doing it unless she knows the person, you know. And I was going back and forth with Jeff at the end of last year about it, and then just finally I gave up. But she's probably the, uh, the closest to a huge comedy bucket list guest I would get. Yeah. Um, Robert Smigel. Yeah. Ian Carvey. But his podcast is what's hurting me with getting like the middle SNL people because they're going on his podcast now. Yeah. And Julie Brown. Julie Brown, yeah. Oh, I I I know the guy who manages her. He's a piece of shit. <laughs> He manages mostly horror movie people, and he is just he is just not a good guy. And I mean, I, I'm sure you could you know probably message her on Facebook or something and and get a response back that way from her and stuff. But I I, I wouldn't deal with him. He's 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 a he's a pos. <laughs> I've, I've emailed him, but he never got back. So never. is it is it Mike? Yeah. Yeah, I don't like him. Yeah. Yeah, well when I started the podcast it was it was horror and sci fi only and then I started to break away because people like him and so many people in the horror community are just not good people. I mean I still love horror, still interview people from horror, but it's it's usually from people who are not part of that convention crowd now. Um but yeah, I explore that, I explore comedy, everything now. Um what, uh, so what's your favorite era of Saturday Night Live? Uh, that, that is a tough question. Uh, I would say this is that the Dana Carvey, John Lovitz, Phil Hartman era, and then the original. Mm-hmm. Because I actually looked up the episodes, and like the, the 14th season, which is weird, but yeah. the 88 to 89 season had the best uh, episodes throughout the whole show the whole season than even the first any, any year in the first five mm-hmm. you know the Milton Berle episode and, and the Louis Lasser episode it, that kills a, a, you know, an average you know, season if you're gonna, you know, rate them throughout the season but the, the 12, 14 season every episode was great yeah you know I yeah I'll admit there was a lot of sketches in the first five years that were awful but there was a lot of fucking masterpieces too and i just i love that first five years of saturday night live because anything went they were be they were they were staying true to their subversive nonconformist roots of irreverent comedy you know and it just there's something magical about it you know and it it really changed comedy and these guys and girls went on to you know big careers after that they were the first ones but I also like, you know, the Lovitz, Carvey, Neilan, Sandler era, and the Will, the Will Ferrell and Chris Kattan era. I, I, I didn't have a full appreciation of them at the time, but looking back, I was like, God, they're probably the last great cast, you know? I haven't been too fond of the last few casts. I think that the, the casts now are very top-heavy with really good performers, like three or four really good performers, and then the rest are guys who can do one or two things, or girls who can specialize in one or two little things. Yeah. You can't hold a cast like that. Have you have you read Chris Kattan's book? No, he, that's the only SNL book I haven't written, read. Oh, uh, it's good. It is really good. And you just, you feel bad for the guy because of all the circumstances he put himself in because his ego got in the way, and plus he didn't believe in himself at the same time it's it's a sad story you know hopefully you know in this 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 you know the second act that he's uh, been doing you know that he's been going around doing stand up with a one man show and stuff hopefully you know he'll you know hopefully he learned from all his mistakes mm. i 
just know all the stories that Jim Brewer would say about him. Oh, were they bad? Yeah. <laughs> but messing with Norm, and Norm would just get him at the last second. And... Oh, yeah. <laughs> God, yeah. Yeah, he talks about that in the book. Um, the Pamela Lee episode? Which episode? It was with Pamela Anderson. Uh, I think so. I think that's mentioned in there. Yeah, that's, that was a story. That, but yeah, I also like the the Ebersole years, and those are the people yeah. that are the nicest and easiest to contact and talk to. Really? Yeah, I've been trying to get in touch with Mary Gross and Robin Duke for a while, and I've thought about reaching out to Tim Kazarinski, but um, I haven't had the chance yet. Tim Kazarinski, this is, I know you just, what you, what you just said, Ruth, um, will not, does not do podcasts anymore. He did Gary Kroger's podcast, uh-huh. and then he said, I'm, this is the last one I'm ever going to do, and he's been serious about that. Oh, God. Well, I know Robin Duke has a book coming out soon. Yeah, I can give you, I can give you contact, my contact information for her. She was great. Yeah. I, I talked to, um, and I know you talked to him, too. I talked to Steve Campman last year. Oh, he was really nice. Yeah. He, he's, yeah, he's a great guy. And we, uh, in, in just one hour, because that's all the time that we had, we, we, we covered so much. It, it was just amazing. Um he he was great, yeah. So let, uh, let let's get into um, Ian talks comedy. Uh, I mean, was it, this was obviously probably a quarantine project, right? Yeah, it was a quarantine project, and um, also two two things. One was actually Harry Anderson and Fred Willard dying, and mm-hmm. me never getting a chance to say I really like what you did, and you were very funny. So I said. I'm going to create a podcast, and I'm going to get people that did something, even if it's a little thing that I loved, and tell them that. And so the first person I contacted was Matt Newman, and he was he was a writer for Saturday Night Live in the fifth season, and, the, and a little bit of the sixth season, and he was the head writer of Not Necessarily the News. Mm-hmm. But he wrote this sketch that I loved, um, called Dean's Variety Store when Bob Newhart hosted. It, it was a store that had one of everything. Mm-hmm. And I text, I found his, on the internet, I found his uh, email, uh, his cell number. So I texted him. I said, you the Matt Newman who wrote Dean's Variety Store in 1980. He's like, yes, why? And I said, I'm, I'm starting a podcast. Would you be interested in being my first guest? And then I did a lot of you know, looking into what he's done, and so I had questions, and I wanted to tell him that I really thought that was funny. He had a lot of great stories, and then I, uh, and then he introduced me to some of his friends, Elaine Saracen, who yeah, yeah, and uh, Walter Williams and Mr. Bill, and so he introduced me to those two people right there, and I would never have gotten to talk to them. Mm-hmm. And then I would say, okay, what was my favorite episode of Night Court? My favorite. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I thought you were asking me what my favorite episode of Night Court was. Well, what's your favorite episode of Night Court? The Red Rider episode. Is it Red what? Rider? Red Ranger. Who was that masked man? Yeah, the masked man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I talked to uh, Mitch Lawrence, who was uh, in that episode. He was the guy who was trying to get. Who was suing him? Mm-hmm. Um. And who, so I said, what was my favorite episode of uh, Night Court? Oh, the one where they had to do 200 cases in a night. Yeah. Who wrote that? Larry Strother. Let me see if he's listed in the phone book. That's what I did. Mm-hmm. And then I just got more and more people, and and how did your, how did your start? Mine? Um, so I had a car accident in 2015, and I spent 30 days in a coma, and during that time... I had just discovered the podcast world just before the accident. I started listening to Rogan during that month of January. But then, when I was in the hospital, um, I remember I went to go listen to uh, a new episode of Rogan. And in the search box, WTF with Mark Marin came up. Now, I, I watched Mark Marin on Conan back in the 90s. I never thought he was that funny of a comedian. But 
I see that he was interviewing all these huge names, and I was like, God, when did this start, right? So I, I started listening, and I was like, God, Marin's a good fucking interviewer, you know? I didn't think he was a funny comedian, but he's a damn good interviewer. So I said, okay, I'm going to start a podcast, and I this is the way a podcast should be. It's real uh, the, the host and the guests are swearing. They're talking about real things. I'm like, this is how it should be. Not that fucking stupid, superficial talk show format. So it took a while. It took me, you know, almost two years, um, from the time of recovery to when me and my mother finally got a a place to live because we were homeless at the time. We were going through rough times. So, um, after, I got, I got motivated to try to do a podcast again because I did make an attempt about six months into recovery and no one was on board, so I got discouraged. But then I went to go see Kevin Smith do a screening for a movie at the San Jose Improv, a movie that he made called Yoga Hosers, and he gave this speech about podcasts near the end that just uplifted me. And then I met him at the meet and greet. He was great. Um... So then um, we finally moved into this place in April of 2017, and I was sick for a few weeks. I mean, ugh, I was I, probably one of the worst sicknesses I've ever had in my life. So as soon as I recover, I start the podcast. Now, I don't know if you've seen the first 24, but they were they started out as visual of me on camera, wearing sunglasses and a hat backwards and being this persona that I came up with, Tommy Throwback Kovac. And then I would um, play the interview audio only. And at first it was on a dictation recorder, which worked the first maybe eight episodes. And then it started to get really bad. And only a couple of people complained because I, I, I interview a lot of people who don't listen to podcasts after they do them, you know? So Ben, by 24, I'm like... I'm enjoying doing this, you know, and I love interviewing. I got to figure out a better way to record. So then I just put um, my, uh, my, I just put my, you know, I turned my cell phone recorder on and put it against the, uh, the landline and then voila, splat from the past. And then I stopped doing the visual thing because I got tired of dressing up and seeing myself, you know, go from heavy to heavier to my hair getting grayer and losing my hair. <laughs> hair even though I was wearing a hat and it's been audio only since like June of 2018 and I like doing it this way Hmm, and you like doing it on YouTube yeah to just do it on YouTube but I didn't want to put it on major platforms just yet it's just easier for me to go to YouTube and you know and then you know edit a couple things and then that's it but how I found out about your podcast so, yeah, I was looking for any previous interviews that Lane Sarasone did because I wanted to interview him, and I was trying to get him through his magazine, which you told me he retired from. Um, I found your interview with him, and I listened to it. Quite frankly, Ian, I almost didn't want to listen to any more, but you grew on me because I, I your, your style was very similar to mine in terms of you like to go through everything that they've done and stuff, you know, and I don't listen, I don't like listening to myself or my podcast, so I thought it was very similar, but then you grew on me, and I liked the guests that you have, so then I kept on listening, you know, and then I was really shocked when you emailed me months ago, and, and um, you told me that you listened to mine. How did you stumble upon mine? Research for a guest that you had. I don't remember who it was. Uh-huh. Did you have Melanie Chardoff on? Yeah. Melanie Chardoff. Yeah. That was that that was three years in the making. I had reached out to her in twenty eighteen and then when her book finally came out, I was the first one that she did an interview with. And it was better than I thought it was gonna be. Uh her and I we just related to each other, just very quirky and just had we just had a great talk i wouldn't mind talking to her again if she had something to promote she was she's one in my uh top favorite guests Dude, her, like she's like best friends with lorraine newman oh yeah yeah i knew they were friends but i didn't know that they were that close they but, call each other mel and Lair on us on twitter yeah I, i'm very careful um getting guests through other guests i want to make sure that they are very close, and I want to make sure that they had a good experience with me and they just weren't placating me, you know, because I've been disappointed by a few people um, who were who were in that situation. But 
yeah, I mean, who knows if I'll if I'll ever get uh, Lorraine Newman, but you know, it, it, at least I interviewed Tracy, her sister. Have you interviewed her? No, but I, I really would want to. I don't, try not to do. It's hard. Like what you just said about me. It's like when I when I listen to you interview somebody, it's like, well, I'm going to ask them the same questions. Mm hmm. Well. She, uh, she's easy to get in touch with on Facebook and she'll, she'll talk to just about anybody. She is just so awesome. I mean, she's got stories about, you know, um, playing at Catch a Rising Star and the improv and stuff back in the day. You know, she went on a date with Rodney Dangerfield and she's got a lot of great stories. You know, she wrote that Emmy award winning episode of Ellen where she comes out, you know, her and Jonathan Stark. So I've, I've talked to Jonathan Stark too. He said, "Please keep your questions about Jim Belushi to a minimal because they didn't get along." Oh, and she also wrote for Cheers. Yes, they did. They, I think that was the first one that they did. They did Cheers, then they went to Ellen, then they went to According to Jim. Yeah, and then uh, they've been kind of, they've been, you know, they're still friends, but they just don't write for TV anymore because it's changed, you know. And uh, Tracy, she's always done a million different things, and right now she's back into her folk music phase. She plays clubs around LA. That's cool. Yeah, but um, I recommend her. I, I interviewed her um, in 2020. Uh, Harlan Bull put me in touch with her, and she called me back two hours later to tell me that I was a gentleman and that she just had a blast with me, and it's, it, it means a lot to me. I wish I had that recorded. It was, it was so beautiful. Um, yeah, my, my friends and family just couldn't believe it. They, their, their jaws dropped when I announced I was going to be interviewing her. Yep, I did too. Happy birthday to her. Yeah. He just died. Yeah, God, that was so that was so sad. I was glad that I I was one of his last interviews at least. And I mean, he you could tell that when I talked to him, he was kind of over it because he had written a book, you know. But he he had fun with me, I think, and I I think I did right by him. Um, yeah, you've interviewed a lot of people that I've interviewed, like him and Campman and Hugh Fink and Denny Johnston and uh, Chris Butler from The Waitresses and Ron James. Oh, my God. Did, 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 did you find Ron to be bitter? Because I did. I didn't. Uh, I didn't find him to be bitter. I just... just Negative. Right? Just seemed to use a lot of words when, when, when a few words will do. Yes, he, yeah, I mean, well, the way I found it was this, you know, like, th this is what happened. We talked for an hour, and I can't believe I lasted this long with him. Very quickly, you know, I mean, once we got to talking about when he was at Second City in the first 10 or 12 minutes, and then um, he, I think he had a tiny part in Strange Brew or something, right? I was, like, about to ask him about that, and he, and he, and he cut me off and said, if you think I'm going to talk about, you know, my experiences in the U.S., you're, you're mistaken, buddy, because, because the U.S. did not treat me very well. And then he started going into this spiel about how he's popular in Canada, but not in the U.S., you know, and it, it's, it came off as negative and bitter to me, you know. But in the last few minutes, I got him to talk about working with Jim Varney in Ernest Rides Again, and he told me that, Jim really inspired inspired him to pursue stand up because he had just come back from a couple of years in LA. He was back in Canada. He didn't know where his life was going to go next, you know, but he did one of his stand up routines that he did on stage in LA to Jim and Jim laughed and it really inspired him to go do it. He said, you know, you know, he didn't agree with Jim's politics because Jim was right wing, but he was inspired by the guy, and he he owes that to him. Oh, that's interesting. I no, my interview was very cut and dry, very like mm -hmm. very not you know wasn't anything 
to write home about. You know, he was he was, he was pleasant. Yeah, he was pleasant, but just there was just so much negativity there. It's like you know, count your blessings, man. I mean, you are popular in Canada, you know, but it's, it's you're lucky to be popular there, you know. You don't have to hold, hold a grudge against the U.S., you know, because some people just they don't hit it big in the U.S. Some people have to go to Canada, or the U.K., you know, like Bill Hicks. You know, near the end of his life, he went to the U.K. and he got popular there. Yeah, my most my most downloaded episode is Rich Hall. And oh, I haven't heard that one. I didn't know you had Rich Hall. Yeah, and he, oh. he was much bigger in the UK than he was in the United States. Yeah, and he's a prolific guy. I mean, he's done a lot of different things. Yeah, he's, he was, I don't know how I got, I got really lucky. Because <laughs> I haven't heard him on a podcast besides mine. Yeah, I think him and Mark Maron would have a good conversation if he went on there. Uh... Yeah, I mean, you, you had Sean Kelly, who we just lost, who I didn't uh, get an interview with, sadly. I mean, I talk, I did get to talk to Ann Beats before she passed about, um, we talked a lot about National Lampoon in that conversation. Uh, that, that conversation, unfortunately, was not completed because um, her daughter, whoever was in the house with her that day, lured her away. And so we only got to... The, the genesis of Square Pegs, and then that was it. And then she told me she would come back on. I reached out to her at Christmas time, no response. And then um, just days before her death, I was thinking about reaching out again, and then her death came up, and I was like, damn it. That's, that was an incomplete interview, but hey, at least we got to the surface of what I loved the most of her career, and that's Saturday Night Live and National Lampoon. Right. She was booked for May. 29th and she died in April oh god so yeah, so she was booked and I also had another person uh, this guy Frank Mueller he was supposed to come on the first week of January he died like last week of December he was a writer he wrote are you a Simpsons fan? oh yeah I'm a huge Simpsons fan especially from the early years the most he wrote the episode where um the Valentine's Day episode with Ralph falling in love with Lisa. I love Lisa. Mm -hmm. As well as a show that I loved that didn't really do that well called Grand. Mm -hmm. my, my, uh, Michael McKeon. And he was like, um, he was like, you know what? Anybody who's, I've never gotten a compliment on Grand. I want uh, I'll definitely come on your show. And then he died uh, three weeks before. Oh, God. I, I hate when that happens. There's people... I've I've um, scheduled and they they died like uh, Mark Blum, character actor. He died of COVID, unfortunately. Um, Jewel Reed, who was a horror filmmaker, he he was scheduled to do it a month before the pandemic broke out, but he was already. Uh, full of COVID in the hospital at the time, and he had announced on Facebook that he was getting out the day of our interview, and and he never picked up the phone. He was in the hospital until he he died, like in I think first week of April or something like that. Sadly, uh, yeah, it it sucks. I mean, I was I was James Drury's last interview. I was Richard Hurd's last interview. You know, I interviewed them both two weeks before they died. I was a little unsatisfied with both because I think they knew it. They they kind of, you know, wanted to do their own thing in this interview. You know, Richard was very inquisitive. He wanted to know about me. And James, he tried to get out of finishing the already half-hour scheduled interview at like 15 minutes, but I kept it going. And it, 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 we, we kept it going for about 20 more minutes, and then we finished it. Uh, Brian McConaughey mm -hmm. I interviewed, you know, from Lampoon yeah. and, uh, and SNL. I had covid Mm -hmm. So I didn't know and the next day, uh, like the whole time I'm coughing, and he had a he had a cold. And he's like, "Oh, how did I give you my cough uh, on the phone?" I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm like, "I don't know. I just started coughing. I don't know why." And the next time my wife called, she's like, "I got COVID. Go to the doctor and get tested." And then I had COVID. That sucks. That really sucks. <laughs> didn't do in interviews either. The only other interview. Um, He's ever done a podcast, and the only other interview he ever did, he said, he told me the story. He was on Letterman uh -huh. and in 1982, and it went so badly that David Letterman said, who booked this effing guy? <laughs> yeah. He's promoting the Strange World. Yeah. Oh, my God. 
I know that you uh, interviewed Phil Proctor. Have you? Have, I talked to David Osman. Have you reached out to him? No, that was actually a um, Abraham, uh, Jeff Abraham. Okay. 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 Yeah, David Osman. I think I got him through his website. He's he's pleasant. You know, we were talking about you know those those fire sign theater records and just how subversive they were. I I love them. You know, very surreal in humor. I had to listen to them all because I didn't know the fire sign theater. They said, "Would you like to talk to Phil Proctor?" And I'm like, "Okay, I know that name." I'm like, "Yeah, sure." And then I listened to all the records. I'm like, "Oh my god, this guy's great." My my dad wasn't too familiar with them either when I told him about them because you know he grew up in the '70s with Cheech and Chong and and uh, Richard Pryor, Steve Martin, all those records and stuff, but he didn't know Fire Sign Theater. Yeah, I was like, oh my god, that hilarious bit with the televangelist and the guys eating the hot dog at home that just cracks me up. I, I, I was more of a fan of the credibility gap. Yes, I talked to David Lander um, in 2018. And I, that's one of my worst interviews, only because I wasn't ready to interview him. I should have waited a little bit, but um, we 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 talked a little bit about that. He told me about about when he burned that script, uh, Laverne, um, Laverne and Shirley, that that famous story, and he got a little bit bitter about some of the movies he was in. But um, I got I got some good anecdotes out of him in twenty minutes. Yeah. Well, he was like, um, "Well, I'll give you an hour, but the first half hour we have to talk about my radio show, and then I'll let you talk about anything except for the except for uh, Saturday Night Live for the other half hour." Okay. And then I, I asked him about Saturday, Saturday Night Live and this one particular sketch, uh, which involves the N word. Yep, I, I heard it. I was cracking up at what Rodney said. You're not going to do that on TV, are you? <laughs> Oh man, that's hilarious! <laughs> I told that to my dad, and he cracked up. I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God, you interviewed uh, Dan Vitale before he passed. How did that come about? That was. I just. Um, I just Facebooked him, and uh -huh. and I asked him if he would do it. He's like, I. Uh, He's like, I've done two interviews. That was the Andy Hogland. And one was one. Mark Marin. Oh, yeah, it was right. And Marin. And yeah. Marin got me a lot of people who didn't know I was alive saying hey to me on Facebook. So, yeah, what, what the hell? Yeah. So he was on the phone with me for four hours, and I had to just cut stuff down to make it, I don't even know, was it two hours long? <laughs> I, I, I haven't listened to it yet. I just found out as I was going through, you know, your channel of, of episodes, because there's a lot I haven't heard yet. Um, yeah, God, I, oh, God, I regret not reaching out to him then, because I loved his interview on Marin. You know, uh, the fact that Gary Weiss put him in rehab, that, that, that actually changes my mind. I thought that Gary, that Gary Weiss was an asshole when I interviewed him last summer. I guess he's a good guy after all if he put him in rehab. Oh, I didn't know that. He told me, when he told me the story, he said that, um, this is when you get fired from Siren Live and put into rehab? Yeah, he said that, that Weiss paid for it. Oh, he, I didn't know that part. Yeah. He, he told me that, uh, David Talley told me that the fact that he found out he, was getting, he got fired from Siren Live yeah. is he got summoned to the office of the producers, and this is when Franken and Davis were producing, not, uh, as, as well as writing, but Warren was executive producer so he wasn't doing the job that he always did mm -hmm. this, this is the only year it was like that he got summoned to Franklin Davis' office and he said that Davis is doing a line of coke off his desk and says I mean, Al has to talk to you and he, walk, he walks into Al's office and goes listen we can't, we can't have drugs in, in the offices you, you have to you're fired yeah he's like well Tom Davis just did a line of coke in front of him which yeah. he, he you know it's, I think it's a funny anecdote. Yeah, I, I mean that was a that was a very, I that was that was a very touching story, you know, that he told about his about his life on Marin because I always wondered what happened to him because I remembered him on that season of Saturday Night Live and I was like, whatever happened to that guy and where did he come from? I didn't know he was a stand up, so I I was 
um, I was baffled when I found that out. Um, I know, so how did uh, Stacy Milken come about? Because I've had her on here twice. I adore her. Um, I'm trying to... Uh, oh, the movie Serial. Uh-huh. So the movie Serial, which she's great in. Yeah. And I had the writer, the screenplay writer, Michael Elias on, and I'm like, I want to see if I can get... See if I can talk to her. And she was, she was cool. She was really cool. Oh God! I the first interview we did, we talked about her career, and um, the second time we talked about my sex life in graphic detail, and she was giving me, you know, advice, you know, because that's what she does, you know, she's a licensed therapist. It was hilarious. And then in the last half of it, we talked about um, about her relationship with Woody Allen when she was a teenager, and I got some trolls from it. And we talked about a, f a few more credits that uh, I didn't talk about last time with her and stuff. She's awesome. I adore her. I know that when I see her at a convention someday, we're going to give each other a great big hug. No, that's nice. Yeah, she was really cool and really nice. And she said uh, that Joyce Heiser was kind of like a... Uh... <laughs> I know, I heard that. I, I know Joyce very well. She's been on here three times. And, you know, th th there's, th I'll tell you, there's kind of an aura about her where she looks like she may have been that girl back in the day, right? But she is very, um, very kind and compassionate. And, you know, she helps children now. I'm, I'm sure she was that girl back in the day, but now she's, I don't see that about her. Yeah, and, and, and Ellen Barkin was also in that, in that crowd. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I mean, jo I know Joyce is really good friends with Rosanna Arquette. Um, they they used to hang out a lot back in the day, uh, but no, Joyce Joyce is wonderful, and I I make her laugh. I tell her dirty jokes all the time. I told her one when I met her in person just before COVID hit. Uh, there was doing a thirty fifth anniversary screening of just one of the guys at San Francisco Sketch Fest. I, I told her I told her this joke. Oh my God, the 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 reaction was hilarious, and I, I whispered it to her in her ear. And, and I hope she told Sherilyn Fenn that joke after after I walked away. <laughs> it was pretty bad, but uh, hey, can you share it? Oh yeah, I can share it. How do you get your wife to scream twice? Oh, I know. Yes, that. One. Yes, that one. And um, before I before um, I got to go to her meet and greet and ta her meet and greet table, I met Dana Gould by accident. Um, uh, he was he had his tables uh, semi set up for his meet and greet, and his banner wasn't up, so it didn't say Dana Gould on it. So my mom and I went over to him and say, "Is this the uh, just one of the guys meet and greet?" And he's like, "It's not." And I said, and I said, do you know where it is? And he's like, I don't. And then I walked away and then, um, we saw a security person. They said, do you know where the, just one of the guys meet and greet is? And he's like, yeah, over here. And I said, Hey, by the way, who's that guy over there? And she's like, that's Dana Gould. And I'm like, that is Dana Gould. Oh my God. I, 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 he looked familiar, but I couldn't place it. You know? <laughs> I'm sure he did. It was, it was it was two years ago. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Dave Mandel, um, writer for Saturday Night Live, and talked about the episode. One of his favorite moments is the episode where they did the whole show as Planet of the Apes when they had um, Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston hosting. Yeah. Oh, Dana Gould wrote that. Oh no no no! I just know Dana Gould is a big uh, Planet of the Apes fan. Oh okay yeah. I think his podcast is like he's an uh, ape and he talks to uh, human guests. I've, I've interviewed uh, Vampira's niece. She's told me about Dana, about how, you know, they became really close near the end of Vampira's life and stuff. I'm like, that fucking lucky bastard. I'm so jealous of Dana Gould. I, I, he's been a footnote in so many of his idols' lives. Like, I hope I'm a footnote in a lot of my idols' lives, you know? I think I am, but, you know, the day that they ask me to help them, you know, write their memoir or a forward or something, that's when I know I'm truly a footnote in their history. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, it'd be great. I, I, are you Facebook friends with a lot of your guests? Oh, yeah, most of them. Isn't that cool, though? Mm-hmm. It sure is. It's 
it's it's been a wild ride the last five years that I've been doing this, and I I don't know you know what the future holds, but you know I, I still enjoy it. I have days where I don't enjoy it anymore, but days that I do, you know. I'll give you a good example of a day that I didn't. Um, you interviewed uh, Mark Malkoff on the Carson podcast. Mm. Yeah. Well, I reached out to him in January. Didn't hear back until June, first week of June. We did the uh, we did the podcast the following week. It was great. I suggested three people to him to you know wrap up the podcast because he's going to be wrapping it up this summer, and. He emailed me, I think a day or two later after we did the podcast and said, who, who are those names again? And so I gave it to him. And then I got super busy for the whole month of June after that and the first week of July. So then two weeks ago, I email him and, and you know, I told um, those three people about his podcast long before I, I connected with him. Right. But then I kind of reiterated um, when I when I interviewed him, you know. And I said, hey, did you reach out to those people, right? And he sends me this email saying, hey, Tommy, I know you're trying to help, but it, it, it's not necessary. I have uh, one guest booked for the final show. Thanks so much. And I was, I, was, I was a little upset by that because, you know, I got them excited. You know, they've been wanting to tell, you know, their Johnny Carson stories at that kind of a platform for a long time. And I just felt like he was kind of blowing me off because I was a YouTuber. You know what I mean? mean yeah i think he had it booked because i offered him somebody too that was on the carson show and he's like mm -hmm. he's like yeah, i tried to get him three years ago mm -hmm. uh but i got my final guests well it's been a while now and he he hasn't put up the the final episode so we shall see we we shall see but yeah that that kind of cut me like a knife but who are the, who are the people who you don't oh stephanie hodge who's a very good friend of mine i recommend you reach out to her she i she's, was i like i like nurses but I, 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 is she bitter about that um i think she's more bitter about uh um Un unhappily ever after, you know, but no, she had great experiences on nurses. That's like one of her favorite, um, uh, jobs that she had. Uh, she's willing to talk about anything of her career, to be honest with you. No, I'm a fan of hers. I remember her when she was a comedian, stand up comedian before nurse. Yeah, I mean, you know, she got she got fired from Unhappily Ever After, which was her show, and then it got taken from her, you know, by the other people. They started writing, you know, more for the other people, you know, and then of course Bobcat stuffed animal character on the show, Mister Mister Floppy, you know, basically took over the show as well, you know. But she's she's happy to talk about it, you know, but. You know, you're not going to hear too much negativity. I mean, she'll probably throw in, you know, a sexual harassment story or two, but she's she's great to talk to, you know, and I've, I've had dinner with her in L.A., and she's one of my biggest supporters. Um, the others are uh, Jackie Giro. She was a late-night erotica movie actress in the 70s and a little bit of the 80s doing nude movies, you know, not a, not porn, but, like, you know, exploitation, you know, X-rated movies. Annie Wells. She was on, uh, she was on Johnny five times, and she's got stories about that, and it didn't end well with her and Johnny, and so I recommended her, and then Sandy Gennaro is a rock drummer. I'm having him on again for the second time on Monday to promote his new memoir. He's got a couple Johnny stories because he played Stump the Band um, from the crowd once, and then he was on with Cindy Lauper as her drummer, and he interacted with Johnny backstage. Uh, so Johnny was a drummer? Yep. That's cool. I didn't even have a big announcement tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, so I talked to him on Monday for the second time. Um, you said get your tissue, so I didn't know if, if that meant it was a porn star oh. or somebody you were going to cry over. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not going to say who it is until I put it on social media because I'm actually, I, I, was, I, I was supposed to have a private call with her manager uh, before our interview, and then the, the call went to voicemail, so I'm waiting on that. So, I, so I'll, I'll announce it when, I, when, when it comes up. Um, I have just a couple of questions uh, for you. Uh -huh. where, where do you get um, the names of these, uh, of these people? Like, like these movies I've never, like, 
they're like small roles in a lot of movies. Like, what made you want to talk to the, not talk to them, but even like say, oh, that'd be a person I could talk to. I, you know, I'm a very observant human being. I, I when I watch a movie, I, I notice everybody, whether they play a big part, small part, and sometimes it's just a matter of of you know getting getting a um, a person in general from the movie, and if it may be hard getting the star or something like that, I'll just go for the little person. You know, I mean, it's it's not. Um, it's not rocket science. I can just do that, you know. And I have found they have better stories. They are more humble. And they are a lot nicer. And I become friends with a lot of them. And then how do you, you just Facebook find them? Yeah, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, if they have a website, uh, Twitter, um, stuff like that. Oh, one person I recommend. Have you talked to any groundlings? No, uh, this is the thing that... Oh, I'm going to talk to Roger Erschbacher. Okay, I'm going to give you a list of names for the groundlings that you should talk to because I've well, talked to so many of them. I got, I got a lot of Second City people in my in the history of my show, but I, I haven't got. It'll be my first groundling, and I'm, I keep trying to get groundlings, and they won't. I haven't, I haven't had success. Well, I can get you Terry Bolo. Um, she was one of the founding members. And she was in Carrie and Pee Wee's Big Adventure and a shitload of movies where she's the, um, you know, she's um, a tiny bit player. And she's one of my closest friends. I, I've had lunch with her in L.A. and we talk on the phone quite frequently. And we send each other Christmas birthday cards, everything. I'm very close with her. She'd be happy to do your show and have a conversation about comedy. That, that's cool. Yeah, and, and um, so Facebook, I'll reach out to her on Facebook. Um, how'd you get Adrian Barbeau? Um, let's see. So I had reached out in 2017 and the guy who was managing her at the time had just left, but his name rem remained on her uh, management for a long, long time. So I gave up for a while. And then one day last year, I happened to go on her website and she, she had a, um, she didn't have, it wasn't a manager. It was like a, it was like a personal assistant publicist type of a person. So I reached out, and we went back and forth for half a year, because this was early last year. And then by November, I got Adrian Barbeau on, and she gave me pretty much the same interview she gives everybody. You know, she does this, she, you know, you ask her a question, she giggles, and then she answers it the same way she answered every question. It's almost like she has a script. But she's great. You know, I have no complaints. I met her once at a convention, and she was very lovely to me. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any episodes that where the tape broke and it didn't work and the whole episode's gone? Uh, re okay, repeat that question because I, I think I have the gist of what you said, but I need to be sure. Sure, I tape, I have Anchor. Uh, I use Anchor.fm, mm -hmm. and sometimes I'll tape something and then I'll go back to listen to it or to edit it, and the other person's audio is not there. I mean, I've had audio issues, you know, obviously there have been, there were times when I forgot to clean out my phone and, um, the, the sound was very low and sometimes you just can't control, you can't control over it because sometimes, you know, the person will be out of range wherever they're at, like in the mountains or something. And it, the sound is very low, but no, I've never had an experience where I went back and listened and there was nothing. Yeah. So that this happened four times. Uh, <laughs> Mark Wiener, mm -hmm. very nice guy. Um, Sean Kelly, and he came back and did it again. Oh, that's good. And um, uh, John Fenia. Mm -hmm. you know him from Square Pegs? Yeah. Have you had him on? No. I, to be honest with you, I'm a little bitter about Square Pegs because I tried to get Amy Linker on, and she said, and she said, and she said, sure, I'll do it. You know, can you send me the questions though? I sent her the questions, and then she didn't want to do it. Huh. And they weren't hard hitting; they were just they were just honest, straightforward questions. I wasn't looking for any sensation or scandal or anything. Ironically, Chris Butler gave me a little sensation about the show. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I heard a um, a female um, writer who was good friends with Ann Beats give a little sensation about the show, and she didn't even work on it, but she was close friends with Ann. Mm. Yeah. So, I I, I have so I wanted to ask this. I, you know, you have you have a very interesting structure in that 
you begin the show with an intro, but there's no outro. Why is that? Huh. I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea. Thanks. That's an interesting question. I know another guy who does that, and I, I find it interesting. I, I don't know. I just I like having them say goodbye. Mm-hmm. And then that be the outro, because it's uh, like a phone call. Yeah. Who, who? And the first one was that got cut off, and then it was Dave Thomas. Oh, Dave Thomas. Messy TV. Yeah, love him. And I talked to him for an hour and a half, and and it just it didn't take. But I was I, I was so angry with oh. the, with the company. Hopefully, he never found out. <laughs> um, no, he didn't find out. But um, I passed. I I'm friends with. Uh, with uh, Ken Reed, TV Guidance Counselor. Uh huh. I don't know if you know that podcast. Oh, I know it. Yeah. He he. Uh, his dream is to talk to Dave Thomas. So I I told Dave Thomas at the end of our interview. I said, by the way, this is a guy who uh, would love to interview you. He said, Oh, give him my email. Mm-hmm. And he went on. So that was cool. Who who's the most difficult guest you've had? Behavior-wise. Behavior-wise. All right. Well, this is a guy. This is a guy who's actually a friend of the family. Uh-huh. Um, Mark Rothman. He he was Lil Gans's partner. Yeah. And they broke up, and Lil Gans wrote all those movies. And and this guy does did pretty well, but he 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 had a stroke. Mm-hmm. And I asked him the questions, and he talked from, it was only like a 35, 40 minute interview, and he was like, yes, yes, that was the answer. Yeah. And then, after it stopped, he was like, well, how, how's, it, how's your family? I'm like, good, how's your mom? And he was like, oh, and by the way, fuck Lil Gaines. I'm like, oh. Wow. <laughs> that, was, that was off the air, but. That, yeah. oh, oh my God. Yeah. I, you know, I, you know, I've interviewed, I, I've interviewed writers, not a whole lot because they have a tendency to be bitter, but they always, yeah, say they always get bitter that someone took credit or someone changed their ideas and stuff. I try not to interview writers that much. Yeah. But I haven't had anybody, I didn't, I got the feeling that Tom Leopold didn't like me, but that, that's, <laughs> that's like the only I want to have the person like me, and and if I asked them to do a, a do it again, they would. Yeah. Or just not hate me. Same here. A lot of people have come back on. A lot of people, multiple times. Uh, in the beginning, I had trouble getting guests consistently, so I'd ask people to come back on, and they were always happy to do it. You know. Um, Bruce Kirschbaum, who was a writer for uh, Seinfeld. Yeah. And he talked to me for like two hour, two and a half hours, three hours, and he didn't. Get past 1986. <laughs> yeah, I've had a couple people like that. I was like, well, could you come back and talk about uh, Seinfeld? And he worked the movie Back to the Beach. Yeah, I love that movie. And I was like, can we just talk about Seinfeld and Back to the Beach when you, when, when you come back? So, it was just those two things. He still talked for, for almost two hours. In, in terms of comedy, I haven't had a difficult guess you know, I get an occasional curmudgeon or so, but most most of the people I've talked to who who have been difficult, there's only like maybe fifteen or sixteen of them. It's mostly in the in the movie world. Who is your oldest guest? Oldest in terms of age? Yeah. Ed Asner. Oh yeah, I did. Yes, I did. I did see that. Uh, it's, it's a tie between him and Marion Ross. They're both like ninety when I interviewed them. So yeah, they were the oldest. Arnold Marglin, 86, um, he's 86, he created Love American Style. Yeah. His brother played the butler on uh, Heart to Heart. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, uh, not Heart to Heart, um, the one with uh, James Garner, Rockford Files. Rockford Files, yeah. Oh, Stuart Margolin, yeah. Yeah, that's his brother. Ah, interesting. So who, who's on your bucket list that you'd like to get? Mm-hmm. Uh, Julie Brown, like I said before, uh, Dan Aykroyd, mm-hmm. William Cat. William Cat, yeah. <laughs> I talked to the creator of the Grand Poo Grace American Hero, and he said, well, he's not allowed to 
pile on his ass. Yeah. <laughs> I think you should get more stand-up comedians because the, you could have some pretty interesting conversations with them. That's when I listen to my older episodes. It's just like, and then you did this. What was that like? And then all of a sudden, when I, when I had Stephen Campman on, he was like, dude, be yourself. Just, if something funny pops in your head, say it. Yeah. That's like, there's a difference between like the last bunch and, and, the, and the one that you had, Charlene Tilton. This would be also somebody I really like to talk to. Yeah, I remember you said Lydia Cornell. Did you get in touch with her? I tried again. And Lydia, yeah, Lydia Cornell also. Uh, maybe I can lend the hand on that one. I mean, she's pretty good about doing that stuff. She's just so wonderful and so funny. And <clears throat> she, she posts really funny things on social media. Yeah, she does your intro. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I try uh, not to do, uh, once I saw it done by you, now I'm not going to do it, you know what I mean? Yeah. I got, you got to be different, I got to try to be different. My interview style, I, I, I tried to do Mark Malkoff, what Mark, Mark Malkoff uh, did, except I don't have the big, he does the intro with the person not there. Yeah. This one, I'm going to do an intro of you not there, because I know you start by starting with, hi Ian, how are you? Mm-hmm. And I'm not, and I'm going to, pre-tape and in, post-tape an intro actually and then go into the conversation oh that's good yeah I mean stand-up comedians I can recommend are like Stephanie and Rich Scheidner he's got great stories uh, Murray Langston if you can get through to him he, he's a little tough too um, Anita Wise she's been on five times she is so hilarious with that little voice of hers and she's got great stories Children podcast. Oh yeah. But they gave me his phone number and he gave me his phone number and I called him and he didn't call me back for whatever reason. I am so uncomfortable with with phone numbers. I'd rather get their email, you know. I'll tell you a funny, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, so huh. basically, sometimes I just call them on the phone if I get their phone number. Mm -hmm. I'm like, listen, um, I, I'm sorry to bother you. I have a podcast and, and I got yelled at. By Mary Lou Hanner. <laughs> really? I had to stalk her, and, and I'm never going, you know, and this is horrible. You can't just call people up like that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I've never done that. Well, I wouldn't have either, except Guest said, why not? What do, what do, what do, what do, what do, I guess he, he, was, he didn't think anybody would object, but like, we're in the phone book for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, always people can call us. Yeah. Yeah, but she got upset. But the only good thing is, I don't think I pronounced my name in a way that, because my name's so hard to pronounce that she would remember it. She remembers everything. Because, you know, she's had that thing where she remembers everything. But my mm -hmm. name is so hard to understand mm -hmm. that she has not heard it correctly. Well, what'd she say? Uh, that basically, that she's a stalker. And don't show any of those people she knows call her, and how dare you, I call her, that kind of thing. Oh, God. So, I apologize. Ugh. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had some instances I won't go into because... It's just, it's counterproductive, but I've had a couple instances where they, they thought that I called them um, after we did the interview, and uh, one person's uh, manager got a hold of me, and I didn't even book her through the manager, and she'd been on three times without her manager even knowing, and it, it, was, it was an ugly mess, and um, I, I, not that she would ever come back on again after that, you know, but I, I made her persona non grata, unfortunately. Right. I, and they said, have you talked to Melanie? And I'm like, well, I tried, but uh, I never get anything back. And, she, and they called her and she said, yeah, I'll do it. And then her man, her PR person uh, emails me mm -hmm. and asked me for my show's demographics. Yeah. And so I gave him that. I gave it to him and she said, oh, I'm sorry, she won't be doing it. And then I talked to somebody and then 
I talked to the person who said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell Melanie, you know, I'll tell Melanie. Melanie, and he goes, how'd it go with Melanie? And I'm like, she didn't do it. He's like, what, she said she was going to do it. I'm like, well, her, her agent uh, said she, she wasn't going to do it. And then she was going to, she was going to do it, but her agent told her not to. Yeah. That happens a lot with everybody, not just you, but everybody. And uh, I know I know a guy. You know, he does this charity thing uh, called the Doubt Fire Challenge. He wants um, his guests to take a pie in the face for suicide and depression awareness. Right? He told me yesterday this guest I've had on a dozen times, like five or six times, who's a good friend of mine and stuff, who I've met in person a few times. Uh, that her reps t- uh, told her not to do it because they're they're not a fan of slapstick and they would they think it would be bad for her following. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, maybe she's being polite and saying that she doesn't want to do it, so she's using the rep thing. Because I've gotten that because the people I know who don't have representation have said that to me. It's weird. Show business is a weird fucking thing. It's full of narcissism and it's full of arrogance, you know, but if you just write it out and stuff, you know, and just don't forget things, you know, then you'll be okay. Yeah, I'm not trying to make money. Yeah, I'm not trying to make money either. By the way, I was curious to know, like, are you ever going to put any of these on YouTube? Yeah, you just, you know, make a YouTube account and then you just upload it to uh, the, the um, you know, the videos, you know. I mean, I guess, I guess if people want to sit there and I know they, I know they, I, that's how I do it for you. Yeah. There's no, it's just black screen, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's easy, you know. Yeah, I, I might do that. I mean, I guess I can get more people who start those people up. Yeah, well, but I forgot that when I when I talked to Mark Malkoff, I forgot to ask him if he was going to do that with his, you know, after um, he ends the Carson show. I think he would he, he would get uh, a lot of good views on them. You know, he'd probably have to cut out that music, you know, for copyright reasons. But other than that, you know, the interviews would probably do pretty good on YouTube for him. Do you know that there's a, a podcast? Um, these guys, John Daly and John Schroeder. Mm, no. Their, their podcast is, well, they write for Bob's Burgers and okay. actually John Schrader on. Okay. Their, their show is that they sit and they listen to podcasts mm. and then they rate the podcast. Huh, they, interesting. They Mark Malcolm's podcast. Interesting. <laughs> and they were like sort of goofing on the fact that he had all of the stage managers on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, anybody who knew Johnny Carson, I mean, you got to do that. You can't just have the guests, you know? Oh, right. But they're like, well, how much? And they were making fun of, they were making fun of Mark, and I felt bad. Like, like, how much of a, a fan of Johnny Carson is that you, make, that you want to talk to his tax accountant? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he's gotten some good information out of those guys. You know, he got it out of, um, you know, one of the attorneys um, that was involved uh, in the, the, the dispute between him and Wayne Newton because he tried to get Wayne Newton, and Wayne Newton doesn't want to talk about it anymore. Right. So I think of, uh, mm-hmm. people that would be, I don't know if you want to talk, you know, Zeno, or Harry, um, Rodney's opening act, and then he was George Carlin's opening act. Oh, Dennis Blair. Yeah. Did you have him on? N- uh, not yet. I've been contemplating it. Maybe for uh, Easy Money's 40th anniversary next year. Maybe I'll get him. Um, Jim Signorelli, you got it, right? I've tried to get Jim Signorelli. I actually found out one of my biggest supporter guests is actually a friend of his. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, ask her um, at the end of the year to uh, put me in touch with him. I was cur- I was curious. So, who do you got coming up that you can mention? Oh, I can mention. Yeah. So, I've g- this week is I'm just hold on. Let me just go into the website. I can mention everybody I'm who I'm talking to. Uh, oh, Boyd Hale. He. He was a writer for Late Night. This is a, this is a really fun one. This is 
this one where he, one of the ones where they don't want to talk as much about them as they want to talk about you and then just goof off and have fun? Yeah, I, I get those occasionally. I mean, they can be fun at times. He said he wrote for Nurses and Full House and Letterman and okay. he wrote Almost Heroes, the last movie that Chris Farley was in. Okay, nice. And then Roger Eschbacher, uh, mm-hmm. who's a actor, he was in Seinfeld, um, Friends, and uh, a lot of TV shows. And he also writes the Scooby Doo mysteries. Interesting. Wow, that that, that guy is uh, he's got a wide range. I see. <laughs> Joe Grossman, who was a writer for Letterman. Mm-hmm. And then um, on the sixteenth, um, John Schrader, who is a writer and his wife is the create, co-creator of Bob's Burgers. Nice, nice. I got I got a lot of interesting ones coming up, but I don't want to say right right off the bat because it could change, you know. I've had I've had people reschedule on me at last minute after, you know, s- uh, saying too much, you know. But the last thing I want to ask you about though is, you know, that picture of you and Lorne Michaels. Where was that t- taken and when? All right, so that was taken in 2010 at uh, at 30 Rock. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I had I got my uncle uh, was G, James Cigarelli got a disease mm-hmm. uh, in, like 2008. Mm-hmm. It's like chicken pox on your in, on the inside, and no, it was the burns on the inside. I forgot what it's called, but my uncle is a burn nurse. He was in the you know, he was in the Navy and he was in Lebanon. And so my uncle took care of him for like two, three months. He was bedridden. And he's like, anything you want, you know. And he goes, well, my, my nephew, me, is like the biggest Saturday Night Live fan. So I got, I got like, these all access backstage passes to the show in April of, of 2010. And mm-hmm. um, I got a picture taken with all the cast members. And I, I, I ran, literally ran smack into a, uh, Kesha, who was the musical guest, and uh, at the end of the night, Lauren comes out, and I'm like, Mr. Michaels, can I take a picture? And he and he's about to say no, and his daughter looks, and his daughter's like, come on, Dad. And he's like, well, if it's fast. So I get I get next to him, and I have uh, and I take the picture. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so what was your experience like, you know, uh, interacting with him? Well, that was it. That was it? <laughs> yeah. I have a picture of it's fast. And then I, I took, took the picture and he went off in his limo with his kids. Yeah. I, that, it, it, he's he's a very interesting guy, you know. I hear good things. I hear a lot of bad things. It, 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 he's, a, he's just this very interesting mythic dude. Yeah, uh, Ron James. Yeah, Ron James. Then he went to audition for Saturday Night Live, and Lauren said, "Um, you, you would do very well in Canada, not not so much in the United States." So he told him that what his future was going to be. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no wonder he's bitter. <laughs> yeah, supposedly that it's, uh, he's very good at that. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I know. I mean, George Carlin, last quote of his last book, Lord Michaels is a hands and knees cocksucker. That's a brilliant line. <laughs> I, yeah. I asked I asked uh, Kelly Carlin recently about that, about the whole feud and stuff. Yeah, she just said, you know, he was kind of a dick on that first episode. Yeah, um, that was another one. She said on Twitter, no, I will not do your podcast. Just, just, she just put... We did that out one day. She she did that to me four years ago, but then she gave in. Oh, okay. No, because she didn't do it to me. She just did it in general, and I was like, I'm not gonna ask her. She didn't. She didn't say it like that, but it was. She was like, you know, I'm tired of talking about my dad. Let's talk about my. Uh, what was it? Her her art she was doing or something like that uh, at the time. I I can't remember, but it was something along those lines. But. She heard a lot of good things about me from people, and she started following me on Twitter, and then it led to um, the interview once the uh, documentary came out. Mm. Yeah, I had Jeff Abraham on and talked about it, George. Yeah. I don't, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, 
I felt kind of funny doing that interview with her. I just feel, felt like, you know, I, I was giving her um, the same interview she always gets and stuff, and that, you know, I had trouble making her laugh after I said uh, I said that I'm uh, that I grew up wonderfully twisted because of her dad, and she she laughed at that. But then after that, I couldn't make her laugh anymore, and I felt pretty bad about it. Hmm. Yeah, I wanted to get uh, Mindy Rickles. Oh yeah. Or uh, I forgot what her name is. Uh, Jackie Rod, Roddy Angel's daughter, something Roy. Yes. I tried to get them on, but they never got back. I'll tell you, the children of dead comedians, they, they, the key word is operative, you know, because they're so used to having their asses kissed because of who their dads are, and they grew up having a, a weird childhood, you know, you, you feel bad for them, you know, and I've kind of distanced myself from, from interviewing those people. I mean, I've, I've thought about getting Kelly Conway, Tim Conway's daughter on, but I've, I've, I've interviewed Lou Costello's daughter, and she was kind of cunty, and I've talked to Chris Corman, you know, Harvey's uh, son, and he's messed up, you know, I, I, I'm kind of turned off. I mean, I talked to Don Knotts' daughter, she was great, because she's a groundling, and she's got a great sense of humor, she was great, but the others, ah, I just, it's, it, it's, it's a weird, sad thing, man, show business is hard. Yeah, my parents went on a cruise, and they saw Sandy Hackett. Oh, God, City Hackett's a prick. <laughs> you know him? Oh, you know him? Yeah, I've, I've tried getting him on. He said, uh, I sent him an email years ago just telling him how much I like the movie Hamburger, the motion picture, and he sent me a nice long email talking about that movie. But as far as the podcast goes, no. He was kind of a prick to me when I tried to get him on. And he said that they saw him doing Buddy Hackett's act. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's weird. It's tricky, you know. Was I totally radical? Yeah. <laughs> no, totally radical is good. No, I know. Yeah. I'm from the eighties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. What? One last thing I wanted to ask is: is there uh, is is there anybody you won't talk to? No. No. I mean, Hitler's dead. Who? Hitler. <laughs> but, I mean, I guess I wouldn't talk to somebody who I, actually, somebody who I had no interest in because I wasn't a fan of anything they ever did. Yeah, same here. Like, I, I, you know, um, I won't talk to people just because I want to talk to somebody they know. I'm not that kind of a guy, you know. And I talked to a lot of people who were unknown in the beginning because they were willing to do it and say yes. And then... They just, you know, took advantage of me, and then they wrote me off and shit. And, you know, you got to be careful who you give a platform to, because there's a lot of toxic people out there. Mm, like, I would talk to Ben Shapiro. Who's Ben Shapiro? He's a conservative commentator. Okay. I'm trying to think of somebody, uh... I would talk to Louis C.K. in a second. I've had, I've had about ten people say yes and then say no... And it turned out that they were all Scientologists, and they're offended that, you know, I like sci-fi. Isn't that what their, their creator did? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's really fucked up and weird. But, uh... I bought a, a captain's hat and yellow teeth Yeah. at, at a uh, party city, and, you know, like, like, the, like, the skipper's hat, mm -hmm. you know, and... Uh, that was, and I walked around on Halloween, and people were like, who are you? I'm like, L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> like, the guy created a religion, he couldn't get his teeth fixed. He couldn't get his teeth fixed? <laughs> he said, the guy grosses yellow as, they look like horror movie teeth. It was Nosferatu. Mm-hmm. And a captain said, oh, yeah, so I, I mean, yeah, I would talk to, I would talk to Bill Oh, God, not at this point. I wouldn't. <laughs> Would that be a great interview, though? No, because frickin' you, you probably couldn't get one sentence out of him, uh, you know. I, I don't know what it would be. He's probably never going to give an interview again. I'm actually related to Woody Allen, but I would talk, but I never met him. He's like my third cousin once removed. And uh, I talked to Stacey Nelson about that. But uh, I would talk to Woody Allen. 
Well, you should reach out to him and say, hey, I'm your cousin Ian, you know, I got a podcast, let's do it. I found out I have a cousin who's a very famous South African comedian and podcaster. Huh. But, uh, and we were talking and then it just never happened. He's like my fifth cousin, his name is Nick Rabinowitz, and he lives in South Africa. Nick Rabinowitz. He was the number two South African comedian after Trevor Noah, obviously. Interesting. But, yeah, so, and so, I, and I looked him up and I saw his, his stand up. It's pretty funny. And I was like, yeah. It's, but uh, mm-hmm. is there anybody you wouldn't have on? Well, those Scientologists, you know, um, you know, um, any actor who's known for being a scumbag or a Type A, you know. I just I have a very low tolerance for bullshit, and just I'm at the point now where I just don't want drama. I just want a nice, great conversation, and that's it. You know, I'm I don't ask for much. Yeah, I'm trying to. I haven't had to. You know, I heard it's like super cool, but I can't get. This is uh, Ted Danson. I heard it was really cool. Yeah, well, he's yeah. huge. He's huge, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Well, he was on the TV uh, guidance counselor podcast. Okay. Oh. I think sometimes people have you gotten this? So what? Nobody, somebody you haven't requested or asked had a friend that went on yours and, e- and emails you or Facebooks you. Yeah, it depends on who the person would be. You know, I I wouldn't rule that out. No, I mean, have you? I've had it. Have you had that? I I may have. I can't remember. I mean, I did have. Okay, I interviewed. Joanne Deering. Do you remember her? She was a stand-up comedian? No, not really. She was on Star Search, and she was in that uh, that Hulk Hogan movie, Suburban Commando. She played Christopher Lloyd's uh, smart-ass uh, secretary friend who was Larry Miller's you know, secretary. Anyway, um, I had her on the show, and then she told me about... She told uh, her friend about me, this guy, Bruce Kerr, who was like a comedy musical um, satirist um, who never made it, right? And he used to open for uh, Weird Al and stuff. And he became a lawyer. He got out of comedy, became a lawyer. He came on, uh, he messaged me. I said no at first because I I had a lot of weirdos contacting me saying that they could give me a good interview and stuff like that. And so... I blocked him, and then Joanne uh, contacted me and told me that she uh, she put him in touch with me, and I was like, "Is he is he cool?" And she's like, "Yeah." So I unblocked him, did the interview. He just made it all about himself. He was kind of uh, bitter, and it just it, it wasn't a pleasant experience. And he was trying to get me to put his songs on my podcast. I'm like, "Fucking copyright's gonna fucking come after me if I did that." And he's like, "No, I own it, so it's cool." And I'm a lawyer, and I'm like, "It doesn't matter. They got really weird rules on YouTube." He didn't understand that, but, you know, it happened that way, and never again. I'm not going to let that happen again. I've had, I've had where, let's say, five people were in something, mm-hmm. and three, four of them, and then the fifth person's like, so when are you going to talk to me? Yeah. Like, joking around, and I'm like, yeah, I didn't think you would be interested. Yeah. I actually wrote, I actually have had all the SCTV writers yep. who weren't cast members. Oh, yeah, like um, Martin Short's brother. Yeah. Yeah. Mert Rich was another guy here who also wrote for Cheers. Have you gotten uh, uh, Doug Steckler? No, he's the only one. And everyone was saying, uh, you should get him. And I texted him and I, wrote, I emailed I couldn't find an email, so I went to... He had a radio show, but he doesn't have it anymore. Uh-huh. And How about... Never, Doug Steckler's the only one I haven't got. How about John Hemphill? Okay. <laughs> well, Ian, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. This was a, gr- a great talk. I hope um, you enjoy the rest of your summer. You know, keep listening to mine. I'll keep listening to yours, and I'll see if I can get you in contact um, with some people. And be safe out there, man. And who was the person I today? Oh, Robin Duke. I will give you the uh, email for her. I'd appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Ian from English. Ain't he a cool dude? 
Very passionate about comedy, huh? Check out his podcast, Ian Talks Comedy. I listen to it on Spotify. I know there's a lot of haters out there, but it's a great show. Go check it out. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.